Thanks for inviting me. And um, uh, okay, so let me just uh, write down the the title of the talk. It's about the regularization of uh, m, -sub m sub harmonic functions on kilo manifolds, and it's a joint work with Yulun. Okay, so just. Of um, M subharmonic on kilometers. And it's joined with um, <coughs> Uber Shu. Okay, so let me just, um, I'll start first with um, kind of a classical question or analysis. Um, so let me just uh, uh, first start with the case in the Euclidean space. Okay, so let's just say omega in Cn is a bounded domain. And let's say you have a, you have a L1 function on it. Then the familiar way to regularize this function would be just to take the convolution of u in terms of um, smoothing kernel. So, um, so the familiar way to regularize this u is to say that u epsilon of uh, x is, is the integral of the in ball of u of uh, x minus epsilon y pi y dv of y, where you just take the chi is uh, is um, we are here chi is a um, a c infinity function on, on cn such that it's supported in a unit ball. And the uh, integral of chi is just equal to one. So that's the standard uh, smoothing kernel. Well, what about doing the boundary? Oh yeah, so there well, yeah, so let's say just this function is defined in the slightly smaller domain. Okay. Yeah, so x is in omega epsilon, which is the set where you have, you have to be um, distance epsilon away from the boundary. Um, distance from x to the boundary of omega is at least epsilon, good, the epsilon. Okay. okay, so this is a familiar way to um, define the regularization, and uh, so kind of a familiar theorem you know, in your analysis will tell you that, um, so then the u epsilon is smooth. And so that then u epsilon will tend to u almost everywhere. Um, almost everywhere. Okay. So that's the classical result in your analysis. But th there's um, um, one more, more important property for us is that, um, so, so is that, let's say, if u is subharmonic, then u epsilon is also subharmonic. And if u is truly subharmonic, then so is u epsilon. So that's the key property we will, we will be mostly focusing, about, focusing at uh, about the regularization. So in particular, so let me no, just. I still don't have the picture when right. you're near the boundary. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, right, so. Draw a picture, draw a picture. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll draw a picture. So, this is your do this is your domain omega, and um, a slightly smaller domain is that something about this omega epsilon, which is somewhat distance epsilon away from it. Yeah, from the boundary. Yeah, but if the statement doesn't involve this, this you say it's everywhere. This is well, it's almost everywhere, but. I mean, almost everywhere. Yeah. Right. So, but as the epsilon goes away, this omega epsilon will eventually um, kind of uh, expands to all of omega. Yeah, because this uh, has epsilon distance away. As epsilon goes to zero, it will eventually cover all of omega. So the function doesn't get smooth near the boundary, does it? Uh, well, well, it, it, well. If you look just well, if you look at the. Um, the derivatives, it, will, it may blow up near the boundary, but if you stay strictly inside, it will, be, it will remain smooth. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, it's no, just. That's not the problem. I'm just he's doing something and he's saying it gets smooth. Like, it sort of doesn't make sense to me. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, but okay. So this, this isn't okay. This is. I'm just telling something. Should be classical in your analysis. Okay. But, uh, but that's not the main point of our of my of this talk. The main point point is that, um, well, if U itself is subharmonic, so um, so here's uh, if um, U is subharmonic. In other words, um, you take Laplace of u is non-negative, then so is u epsilon. And moreover, if um, the function u is purely subharmonic, In other words, you take the um, the complex Hessian. Well, well, if um, if u is pure subharmonic, so so that u i j bar is uh, is non-negative. Okay, so so here let me assume. Okay, so there are weaker ways to define pure subharmonic, but let's just don't worry about it, and you just assume that um, u is c two when I state this. Um, in other words, u i j bar is non-negative. Then u epsilon of ij bar is also non-negative. So then you have u epsilon of ij bar is non-negative point-wise. OK, so um, let me just uh, state, just, just uh, uh, explain why is that. Um, OK, so this is because, well, if you just uh, differentiate this expression, then you have, uh, so why is that? Um, well, this is because if you just differentiate this expression, the differentiation will just go into the integral sign. So you get that is the ball of u z i z j bar x minus epsilon y i y y. So. So here, for the moment, I don't worry about the boundary. I just want to stay strictly inside the domain. So at least don't worry about the boundary. So from this expression, and you just differentiate under the integral sign, and you just get the complex, the Hessian of u epsilon is just taking the, the, the Hessian of the original function, and you kind of take an average of that. So more generally, um, so more generally, just more generally. So let's say if gamma is a convex cone in Rn, um, so that such that um, the eigenvalues of the Hessian belongs to gamma point-wise in omega, then the same property is true for u epsilon. Then uh, lambda of u epsilon i j bar will remain in the in the same in the core of gamma. Okay. So well, this uh, let me just say say more, a few more, a few words about this. Well, this just uses the property that um, that. If you um, let's say okay, so okay, so here, um, so this uses that the, the set of A is a Hermitian, Hermitian which is Hermitian n by n matrix such that um, the eigenvalue vec well, let me just convex and a symmetrical cone, symmetrical cone. Okay, so the reason why this um, is because um, the cone in Rn would translate to a cone in a space of Hermitian matrix in the sense that uh, if you take the cone which um, which is that such that the lambda of the of the Hermitian matrix belongs to gamma, this would um, translate to a convex cone in the space of Hermitian matrix. This is a convex cone. 
the space of Hermitian matrices. Okay. So that's the um, that's the more general statement, and uh, our and the two cases I'm writing down just corresponds to the the case where gamma is the is the cone in R n, for which the sum of the all the components is uh, positive. And the second case just means that just means corresponds to the cone where you have gamma is equal to gamma is the is the cone for which all the components are positive point component wise. Okay. So of course the this the subharmonic is, is strictly larger than pure subharmonic. So, um, and there are a lot of um, cones which are intermediate between them, and that's, the, that's what is so called the M subharmonic, where M is some integer between one and N. Okay, so, um, so you, you can consider more generally, so there are more general cones. Let me just call this to be gamma one, and this call this to be gamma N. And more generally, you can consider the cone gamma M which is the cone for which uh, sigma k of lambda is positive, where k is between 1 and m. And uh, where sigma k is just the k symmetric polynomial of the eigenvalues. Sigma k is just the k uh, symmetric polynomial. Eigenvalues. Okay. So a case a symmetric polynomial of the vector of uh, lambda one up to lambda n. Okay. Okay. So it is kind of clear that gamma m is a symmetric cone. So gamma m is a symmetric cone. But it's not quite, it's less clear that this gamma m is actually convex. So is this actually a classical result by Gardner in 1959, which says that such a cone is actually convex? So here, here's a result by A.O. Gardner uh, in the 1959, which says that each gamma m is actually convex is a convex symmetric cone. Okay. So this is, okay, so the less obvious one is the, is the convexity of this cone. Okay. So, and uh, so that we have a kind of a hierarchy for the, for the different cones. So that you have like um, gamma one contains gamma two contains gamma three contains gamma n. So there's decreasing uh, family of cones, and the largest one is just um, it's just that the lambda i from one to n is positive, and the, six, the last one is just that lambda i individually is positive. And the first, uh, the biggest cone just, just corresponds to the, the fact that the function itself is subharmonic. And the last one is just means it's subharmonic. Well, it's, it's the same thing as saying that it is subharmonic along every complex line. And for, um, for gamma m in between, that's something called m subharmonic. So, um, so the definition, let me just define the notion of M subharmonic just means that um, the Hessian, lambda of the Hessian belongs to the gamma M. So um, let me just state it for simplicity that 
for, for a function in C2 so that I can define the hash in a classical way. Yes. Anyone have a question? Okay, never mind. Okay, so let's say u is a C2 omega. Okay, so, so we say that u is m subharmonic. U is um, m subharmonic. If um, the eigenvalues of the complex session, Uij bar of z, belongs to gamma m point-wise. So that in particular, so if 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 um, u is m subharmonic, m subharmonic, so is u epsilon. Okay. What are these cones? What are, what? What do this cone look like? Uh, look like well. Um, the two edges, edges that are just cut out by hyperplanes. So, well, okay. So you can think of it like that. So this just means that it is subharmonic if you just take the whole space, subharmonic the whole space. Whereas in the 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 narrowest end, you can think of it as subharmonic along every complex line. And if you have um, M subharmonic, it just means that it is, well, actually it is, str it is stronger than that. Well, but it implies that it is subharmonic along every M dimensional linear, C linear subspace. Yeah. For example, take M to be three, say. N you, equals three, and. Uh, what is gamma two like? What was the picture of gamma two? Um, well, that's a hard question for me. Um, so, um, well, I don't have a, um, I don't have a very, um, like the, explain this in picture, but it just, well, it, it would imply that actually, um, it would, this would be stronger than just saying that it is subharmonic in every two space, but it is X stronger than that. But you can roughly, very roughly, you can just think of it as subharmonic along every, um, on every two plane. Say you could say that, um, say for example, you could do like, um, two, like the quadratic. Like um, z1 square plus z2 square. Uh, well, you want it. You want the sigma two to be positive. Well, you can minus epsilon c times z3 square, I believe. So this one won't be free subharmonic because minus c z3 square. But if I think if c is more enough, then it would be it would be two subharmonic. Well, that's a. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but such an approximation as actually um, it has more properties than just preserving the preserving the inequalities of the Hessian. Well, you say it's uh, U is subharmonic, M subharmonic. You can think of it as a as an inequality for in terms of the Hessian, and the, the regularization process will preserve this inequality. And uh, what I want to say is that it actually has more properties to it. Um, so another property is that it approximates your original function in a one sense, and also it dominates the original function. So, um, so more properties. So the first one is that u epsilon will approach u in a, will approximate u in a L1 sense. And the second one is that, um, well, if you don't like the presence of the boundary, you could just restrict yourself to any compact subset. If you don't like the boundary. Okay. So another property is that the u epsilon will actually dominate the the original function if your u is subharmonic. So um, u epsilon of z is actually bigger than uh, u of z. In other words, u epsilon is, uh, is decreasing sequence. And that, uh, that follows from the fact that this row follows from the mean value inequality. 
for subharmonic functions. In other words, basically it says that if you for subharmonic function, you take the average in the ball, it is always bigger than the value in the center. And actually there is something, uh, we will slightly need something more. So what we actually need is that you epsilon actually dominates the, the soup of u in a small ball. So u epsilon z is actually bigger than the soup of uh, epsilon square ball. Um, uh, z of u of z prime minus some constant times epsilon. So this is what we will need, actually need. Okay, so, so we have this um, very nice, um, so we have, um, so, so the convolution does, has, does um, very nice things about the uh, m sub harmonic, harmonic functions and uh, one natural question is how do these results generalize to manifolds? So when you, when you come to manifold, of course the usual convolution thing doesn't, no longer works. Okay. Because you, are, you can't define x, what is x minus epsilon y. Um, okay, so let me just uh, say that, okay, let me just, maybe I just raise this. So, um, so the natural question um, is this, how does this result generalize to manifolds? In other words, how do you, um, okay, so let me just uh, say, how do you generalize these um, manifolds? Okay, so I'm asking it in, in a very vague way. So, but now you want a smooth preserving the subharmonic. Well, yeah. So this is asked in a very vague way. So I'll make it more precise now. Okay. So, so this is more. So this is very vague formulation of the question. But let me just try to make the question more precise. So more precisely, let me formulate this the question as follows. So let's say you have. Uh, let's just focus on the simplest like the most restrictive class of manifolds, let's say, you, let's say we look at the Kähler manifold. Um, here, compact Kähler. So in other words, this omega zero is uh, locally can be written as g i j bar d z i reg d z g bar on the local coordinates. And this thing is closed. And this g i j bar is positive. And let's say you have a C2 function on M. So of course you could consider weaker notions of, um, of weaker notions of, of functions for which the complex Hessian belongs to a cone, but let's just make it in a classical, everything is in the classical sense. So you have a C2 function on M, and such that um, the eigenvalues of, uh, of, the, of the eigenvalues of this, uh, belongs to gamma. So the the, re, the, no, the notation is such that the eigenvalues of the form defined by u with respect to the metric belongs to your cone gamma. Your gamma is some open and convex cone, convex and symmetric cone. So just fix gamma any convex symmetric cone. Convex and symmetric, and this well, this just means the eigenvalues of the form um, eigenvalues of omega zero plus d d bar u with respect to omega zero. Well, you can show that this is well defined and the. And, you, and the requirement is just that the, such the eigenvalues, the four vectors formed by the eigenvalues, belongs to the, um, belongs to the cone gamma point-wise. 
So this is the um, this is like how you generalize this the notion of gamma subharmonic. Let's just call this condition to be gamma subharmonic. So you have the gamma subharmonic function on a manifold. The question is, we want to find u epsilon. Can you find epsilon? Can you find u epsilon? No matter what, in whatever way you want to define it, but you want to find u epsilon, which satisfies the, the following conditions, such that you don't have to define it by convolution. You can define any way you like, but you just want them to satisfy the following three conditions. So you do, it approximates in a, your one sense. Is less than in L1 is less than c times epsilon to the alpha one. So so this condition just means approximation in L1 sense. And the second one is that it's almost gamma subharmonic in the sense that lambda of g i k bar 1 plus epsilon alpha 2 g j k bar. So, sorry, I forgot the summation in k here. In k here, g k bar uh, plus u j k, u epsilon. JK bar here belongs to gamma. Well, the second condition just means it's almost gamma subharmonic up to an area of power of epsilon. So almost gamma subharmonic. Okay, and the last one is that it has to dominate the original function u in a, in a smaller ball. Third one is that um, u epsilon of z will dominate the soup of b epsilon alpha three of z uh, u of z prime minus c of epsilon to the alpha four, just like that. So it dominates the original function u. U epsilon dominates. And even and on a small on a small ball. Uh, okay, so that's the um, kind of a more precise formulation of the problem. Okay, so so for this question, other than it is a quite it might be an interesting analysis question. It's purely an analysis question, but um, now let me just explain why this um, why a result like this can be used for the other, um, like proving the order continuity of the solutions. So how this, how this um, pure analysis result can be useful. Okay, so, so before I explain um, how, we, how we prove such a result, so let me just first explain um, how this result can be used for um, in getting estimates for, for Hessian equations. Okay, so, um, so let me just uh, state this to the following. Yes? Is there an easy reason to see that you shouldn't impose any property to that it actually is gamma subharmonic? Well, um, well uh, I think you, you, yeah, I think it is possible that um, to get rid of the, get rid of this uh, epsilon to the alpha 2, but let's say you could just say that you take your u epsilon and with the epsilon alpha 2 there, you could just divide by one plus epsilon to the alpha two, so that it just gets, it just, you just divide by one plus that, so that you get u, u epsilon over that, and it will be, um, it, so that this will be strictly gamma without the epsilon thing there. But you, you have, but here, if you have u epsilon over, over one plus epsilon to the alpha two. Um, to use regularization. to prove holder continuity.
of uh, complex hashing equations. Okay, so um, um, okay, so let's say uh, we can think of it. Okay, so let me just uh, set up uh, the. Let me just explain what the kind. What's the what's the equation we will be considering? We'll be considering um, f of uh, lambda of uh, g bar g j k bar plus i j k bar. This this is equal to some right hand side. And um, this belongs to some con gamma. Okay, so let's say we assume that phi is a, is a, is a non, is non positive, but let's, let's uh, don't worry about it for now. So let's say GIK um, bar of GJK bar plus JK bar belongs to gamma. Okay. So there are some assumptions you want to put for about your function f and gamma. Okay, so um, some assumptions. So here, so here um, f, so here gamma in Rn is as before. It is a symmetric and convex symmetric and convex cone. And you have a function, and you have a symmetric function little f defined on gamma. So, uh, okay, so there are some properties. Uh, so here f is a, fun is a positive function defined on gamma, uh, such that the first one says that f is symmetric. Well, everything is symmetric in terms of the, in terms of its variables. And okay, so f as a lambda one up to lambda n is symmetric. Okay. And the second thing says that um, f is increasing with respect to each of these variables. df d lambda i is strictly positive. Okay, so the third one just says that the f is concave. And the last, and the last two conditions for is less usual, but it basically says that the function f should be of homogeneous one. Condition five says that product of is non-degenerate. Non so the last, four, last two conditions basically says, well, it's not exactly equivalent to, but it basically says that the function f is homogeneous is homogeneous, positive homogeneous of degree one. Um, F positive homogeneous. Okay, so all these properties look quite abstract. I will maybe give some examples. Yes, of degree one. Okay. okay, so there are some examples of this little f and gamma. So some examples. Uh, the first one is probably the, the, the most classical. is the is the one where you have um, is the gamma is the yeah. So lambda i being positive. And your f is just a product of eigenvalues to the power of n. And that's the usual uh, complex non-jumper. And the second one is gamma m is the lambda in Rn for which the sigma k of lambda is positive for all k between 1 and m. And you could take your little f to be your sigma m of lambda to the one over m. And the last one is the one considered by 
um, Harvey Lawson, which is the following n minus one pre harmonic, n minus one PSH, where you take gamma to be the cone, um, so that um, k not equal to i of lambda k is positive for all i. And you just call this lambda i2 time. Your case, your summation over all eigenvalues, which is not equal to i. And your f is just the lambda 1 tuta up to lambda n tuta to the power 1 over n. Okay. Okay, so all these, these are all the, uh, the examples of, uh, of, of cones and functions which satisfy all these. Okay, so uh, the theorem that you can prove using this regularization theorem is that is the following. So, um, so we have the, the theorem, which is the, okay so, okay, so maybe I can erase this now. Okay, so is that, um, the theorem is this. Is that, um, let phi be a, uh, bounded, bounded solution, bounded solution to, okay, let me just call this star with um, phi between negative one and capital M, ne negative C, uh, just for, uh, okay, so assume that uh, C zero, okay, so assume that the right hand side, E to the F, has, in, has an LP for some P bigger than N. Um, then you have, uh, and assume that you have regularization holds for the cone gamma. You can, you can find approximation, uh, you can find such approximations for the, for functions for which, which is gamma subharmonic. Assume that, uh, assume regularization Let, 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 let us put this in quotation mark because we haven't proved any full generality. Uh, assume that regularization holds for gamma subharmonic. Then the solution will be in, will be wholly continuous. Then there exists some gamma positive, which cap, with this gamma can be calculated only just in terms of the of the parameters alpha, alphas appearing in the conditions and also in dimension, purely in, computing in terms of that, such that your solution phi is, um, is holder continuous, which depends only on the, and the C right, you know, on the right hand side, can be, cal can be estimated very rigor very um, explicitly, depending only on the background metric and the LNP norm of your solution and the LP norm of the right hand side, and just depending on your data of the problem. Okay, so that's kind of a theorem that you can use to um, you can use to prove this. Okay, so um, maybe I think I just uh, I don't have time to explain how the realization result will lead to that. But um, but just just say that the key ingredient that allows you to use the realization theorem to prove holder continuity is the following stability estimate using the equation. So stability estimate, so the key ingredient that makes the, holder, the proof of holder continuity possible is the um, stability estimate. Which basically allows you to improve the AO1 closeness to L infinity closeness. So, so it has the following estimate, so you have uh, so let V be a bounded, which is a bounded gamma subharmonic function just any bounded gamma subharmonic function then you can improve the L1 difference between V and your solution to L infinity difference so that you have soup of v minus phi is bounded by the constant times v minus phi 
u1 to some power mu. So we have this kind of estimate. What's c? c is just something, some constant which can be estimated purely in terms of the background metric and you purely in terms of your c0 norms of your solution and also the data of the problem. Just some universal constant c you have that for any bounded gamma sum harmonic function, your uh, difference between this function and the solution, the L infinity, L infinity difference can be estimated in terms of L1 difference. So once you use that, you can use the, you can just take V to be your approximation and then you get some, you can see that the difference is in terms, is some powers of epsilon and that would imply the whole continuity. So that's how the regularization theorem can be used to, to to do something like that. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Maybe I've said that. What does the continuity mean in holder continuity? Okay, so the holder continuity just means that you take any pair of points which is close enough. The difference of phi is just the sum x minus y. Well, not here on manifold, you can't write like that. Distance between x and y to a power. So they basically oh. they separate from each other like a power of. Distance. Solution is a right. So, so but so this is holder continuous, but you have, moreover you have kind of universal estimates on that. Okay. So, um, so let me just uh, um, now state how we are. Okay. So, okay. So these are the applications. So, um, another thing I would like to point out is that this this story is almost done for for the case where gamma is pre subharmonic So for pre subharmonic it is um, almost done by Dimaye and, uh, um, and the group working on three potential theory. Um, but for general cone, this is, this is, this is uh, very little is known. Um, realized. I guess I can resist now, but I want to leave that. So the regularization is uh, so, so the regularization and um, holder continuity regularization. This is for the cone for the cone gamma n, which is the the pre subharmonic one. It's positive component wise. How the continuity is done by, um, by a series of works like Berman, Dimaye, and uh, also the Dimaye, um, the new, and the uh, and the uh, quality and the uh, Zirachi and uh, yeah I, yeah I think that is, okay so this they prove the whole continuity of complex moon jumper okay so this is just for the story for the pre subharmonic cone but for general cone it very little is known except for the Euclidean case where you could do the standard convolution. Okay, so let me now state the main theorem. Uh, um, okay, so here's the main result. Um, so unfortunately we have to, so this is, um, so unfortunately we have to assume that your M has non-negative bisectional curvature. Um, so this is unfortunate, but I would hope to um, relax this condition in the future. So let M, Omega zero be um, your Taylor, your compact Taylor manifold. Um, with um, non negative um, holomorphic bisectional curvature. Um, 
and u is uh, and you have a function on the and you have a gamma subharmonic function on, on, on the manifold u is uh, bounded gamma subharmonic and uh, here of course you you could try the usual convolution thing well in a, in a convolution, well, you can just replace that x minus epsilon y by, uh, by the exponential math, but, um, but that, is, that didn't work out well, but instead we try another way of uh, approximation. So you define u epsilon of z to be u epsilon of z to be the soup over all tangent vectors at m, u of exponential math of z plus epsilon minus epsilon zeta z squared. Okay, so that's our u epsilon. Okay, so then the u epsilon will satisfy the, the one, two, and the three. So u epsilon, um, then u epsilon satisfies. That's a definition. Definition of what? That you, yes, that's the definition of u epsilon. So with u epsilon defined this way, then u epsilon will satisfy the, the conditions one, two, and three. Conditions satisfy one, two, and three. Okay. So, um, so let me just say that where this um, curvature assumption is used, the curvature assumption is used to show that it is almost gamma sub for the approximation. Is almost gamma subharmonic. It doesn't rely on the choice of gamma. No, no. It's the, okay, so it doesn't really depend on the the the, 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 the cone gamma. It, at least for now, it doesn't. So, but I guess if you want to like, um, if you want to kind of relax the curvature assumption, um, then um, probably the, the the structure of gamma will play a role. Okay. So, but. Um, but um, if you want to do a general gamma, and, um, and we have tried uh, reasonably hard to remove this curvature assumption, but we were not successful. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I just, um, I have some few minutes to explain that. Um, okay, so let me just say some, okay, so let me just end on one more remark, is that, okay, remark is this. Um, if you assume that u is continuous to start with, then you don't need curvature assumption. So if you assume, assume u is a continuous function to start with, you, and you have, and your, and the continuity, the modulus of continuity will go into the estimates in one, two, and three. And oh, by the way, the, and by the way, the the loss of the loss of gamma subharmonic will not be a power of epsilon, but will be something depending on epsilon, which goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. But it won't be a power, you know, but it won't depend in a power way. So the loss, which here is epsilon to the alpha two, but if you just assume it's, it's uh, continuous, it won't be a power of epsilon, but some, something that goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so. If you assume u, of, u is continuous and you use the modulus of continuity, then you don't need curvature assumption. Modulus of continuity, then no need for then no need for um, then no need for curvature. No assumption needed for curvature. But that's not, not what we want because we want to use such a result to prove the whole continuity of your solution and your u. You are going to take that to be your solution of the equation, which you, are, need, which you need to prove it's whole continuous, so that you don't want to assume it's continuous to start with. So that you want to get approximations which don't really, don't use the continuity of the solution of your u. Okay. So, uh, but for that you have to use the. Um, you, you have, for now, we need the, some curvature assumptions on the, back, on the underlying manifold, uh, which, uh, which we hope to um, relax in the future. Uh, 
I guess I have. I, I guess I can stop now. And thanks everyone for coming.